Chapter 3 I want to tell you when my days changed. It was not long ago. I would estimate it to be about 200 years ago. It came after a night of a billion stars, siblings to our sun. I live in the hollow of a million-year-old tree that died a thousand years ago but still stands in the middle of the park, wrapped in ivy. So this day, after the night of so many sun siblings, I woke in my hollow before dawn and stretched and shook. I ran like light to the ocean to wash off and wake myself in the bone-splitting cold of the frothy shore. On the windy sand, I saw a few jogging people and some mindless jellyfish, clear and round and glistening, who had beached themselves, and saw the waking sky going from black to blue to violet to pink to orange to yellow, and then I went back to the park, clean and awake. There was nothing happening this day. I crossed the highway like a colossus and passed the sleeping windmill and then went about my rounds. I passed the duck's lake, which smells very bad, and there were the ducks, as usual, who do not mind the smell because they are ducks. I crossed over to check out what the human archers were doing. They were only a few, so there were only a few so early. One was wearing a heavy yellow cloak that tickled the grass as she walked. It looked so dramatic, the sweep of yellow against the dewy green of the archery field. Next to the archery grass, there was a soccer complex that was full of young players and their parents. I stayed to watch for a bit, but strangely, they played no soccer. They ran in place and jumped and sat and turned themselves in strange positions and did much cavorting and chanting, and I grew weary and left. Under a tent, two humans sat at a table and seemed to be taking money from parents and putting it into a small silver box. The money they were using was the dirty green paper I have seen, the kind I'm not interested in. I like the coins. The coins. I love the silver, the copper. When they shine in the sun, I want them. I stare and stare. A few times I have brought coins into my hollow, but in the dark of my hollow they shine no more, and so now I leave them in the sun. Yes, I look for them to shine in the sun so I can stare and stare. But not too long. You cannot stare too long or you will be caught. I will be caught. This is how Stephen and Janie and Joni were caught, by standing and staring, and I will not be caught. Instead, I look and revel in the silver and copper, and then I move. I move like a crack of thunder. In the equestrian circle, the people sat atop the horses like kings and queens as the horses trotted inconsequentially in little circles, and I got bored with that, too. I went to the shallow pond where the people sail their tiny boats, and there, a round man I hadn't seen before had brought a new toy boat that went very fast. It was small, smaller than me, the size of a large squirrel, and its speed was intriguing to me. The boat was low and shaped like an arrowhead, and I watched it circle the shallow pond in no time. I felt very sure that I needed to race this boat. I couldn't race the boat if there were many humans around, but the lake was empty except for the round man and his pointy boat. So I began my rocket running and found that I was far faster than this so-called fast boat. I made it look like a funny joke of a boat. I made it look like driftwood. But then it sped up. Aha, I thought, the boat had been holding back. So I ran faster, and the boat sped up, and it was me against the round man and his boat, and we went trice around the pond, neck and neck. I passed the man, and I heard him say, Woo! And I smiled and kept running, knowing I have a different speed reserved for such nonsense, and that is the light speed I can do, which I then did. And yes, I became light itself, and yes, I obliterated that boat and lost the man, too, in the white heat of my own immeasurable propulsion. That happened that day, yes, but it was not the pivotal event I was talking about earlier. I will get to that. Are you coming or what? A voice said. The voice was above me, so I figured it was Bertrand, a gull and my closest friend. It was time to meet the assistant eyes in the top of the great round rock. I did not mention the assistant eyes. I should have. They are my helpers. They help me see what I cannot see. We are comrades, allies. We meet each day when the sun is straight above us in a large rock in the park, a rock so round and high that it cannot be climbed by humans, for there is nowhere to grab onto with opposable thumbs. 
On top of the rock, there is a concavity, like a bowl, and that's where we meet. When we are there, we have a commanding view of the park, but because of its unusual shape, no one below, no one anywhere, no one but birds up above us can see us. I can make my way up quickly, like a feather lifted by wind, because my speed is like flight and my claws like promises kept. When I got there, Bertrand was already perched, scratching his armpit with his beak, which is something he does. I don't ask why. Bertrand is a seagull, a large one. I believe he is the grandest and strongest of all the gulls, but he is humble and has never accepted this designation. Strongest, grandest. He wants only to be Bertrand. Hi, hi, he said. That's how he greets everyone. It sounds silly and delicate even, given his deep voice and his barrel chest and his enormous wings. Ho, ho, I say, which is something I say back to Bertrand. It, it's our thing. I asked him what was new, and he said nothing much was new, but that Rose Marie, one of the gulls of his clan, had done her final flight the day before. This was not unexpected, for she was old and could not fly well anymore, and when you are a gull who is old and cannot fly, that is that. It is a cultural thing among them that I won't go into here, but when it is their time, they go out in a way that they consider spectacular. I knew Rose Marie had been good to Bertrand, and I offered my condolences. She taught me how to fish, he said, looking out to sea. She gave me a fish once, too, I said. It has been rare in my life to eat raw fish from the sea, but occasionally a gull will share, if only to see what a dog like, like me thinks of raw fish. Silver and flapping, eyes desperate, this was how the fish was given to me. It was a wretched experience that I will not duplicate. She'll be missed, Bertrand said of Rosemary. Of all the mammals and birds I know, it's Bertrand who is most inclined to say serious things while looking at the sea, and we allow it. We value this gravita. He is often sought for guidance. Sonia arrived. Sonia is a squirrel. She has a habit of showing up without saying hello, as if she's barged in on a private meeting. She's been one of the assistants coming to meet us on our rock for probably 600 years, so we cannot understand this, the way she persists with this initial shyness. She's missing an eye, and the easy answer would be that this missing eye, lost in a fight with a crow, has caused her reticence. But I'm not sure. The obvious reasons are so often wrong. Hi, hi, Bertrand said. Very hi, she said. This is what she always says when Bertrand says, hi, hi. It is their thing. Seeing that we were still missing two members of the assistant eyes, Sonia raised her small face up to the sun, something that she does up here on those rare sunny days. Sonia lives much of the time under the trees in the shade of the pines and eucalyptus, so when she comes up here, she aims her face to the sun and in this way listens to God. With her good eye closed, she looks so peaceful. When her one eye is open, the other, a cinched star of fur and tissue, she looks conflicted and tense and unsure. Yolanda landed with her usual chaos clatter of wings and feet. Yolanda is a pelican and a clumsy one, which is saying something given that all pelicans are clumsy, ungainly, unlikely in their shape, and ludicrous in their flight. Hi, hi, Bertrand said. Lo, lo, Bert Yolanda said. This is what she says when Bertrand says hi, hi. It's their thing. She, like all pelicans, prefers to fly low, low over the water, inches above the surface. So this is a bit of an in-joke between her and Bertrand, they being creatures that fly. Yolanda also happens to be the only one among us who can read human written language, a gift that she wears lightly. Yolanda flapped her wings a bit and shook her neck, ridding herself of a bit of ocean water and a few stray feathers, and then settled down. Where's Angus? she asked. Angus is a raccoon, and raccoons are nocturnal. 
So Angus is usually late to our meetings and sometimes does not show up at all. I have repeatedly told him that he doesn't have to attend and he doesn't have to be an assistant I, given his sleep habits, but he insists that he wants to be with us, he wants to be an assistant I, and I'm happy that he insists. He sees much at night that we cannot. He's also a bit chubby, as are all raccoons in this park, given the abundance and variety of food available here. So at this particular meeting, when we heard a desperate clawing at the edge of the rounded rock, we knew that it was Angus pulling his rotundness up to us. Hi, hi, Bertrand said. Hey, Bertrand, Angus said, utterly out of breath. So far, he has refused to have a special inside joke greeting with Bertrand. Hey, everyone, he said and collapsed. Let me catch my breath. Go on with, without me. We did, and I began by asking everyone for a general update. Yolanda said she'd seen parks people doing some measuring and marking in the woods out near the biking oval. Could be a new trail, she said. We all knew this measuring was close to where Angus and the other raccoons lived, but where no humans knew that the raccoons lived. As far as the humans knew, there were no raccoons at all in this park. Ha! we thought. Ha ha hoo! There were so many raccoons. I worried about the raccoons, and where would they go if the humans built a new building where the raccoons secretly lived? Bertrand said he'd seen some new trouble travelers. About six of them, he said. They look mischievous. We agreed to keep a lookout for them. Have we all seen the latest in the plaza? Yolanda asked. The plaza in the middle of the park was the most human-dominated part of the park and had been under construction for some time. For as long as anyone could remember, there was a museum there, a big stone building where they kept bones and butterflies and even a great white crocodile who the birds had seen through the high windows. They claimed he was alive, but no one had ever seen him move. But now a new second building was being constructed across the plaza from the museum, and none of us could figure out what it would be. So far, a lot of cement, Bertrand said. All I see every day is more cement. They bring it in those conical trucks that beep when they go backward. For a time, everyone complained together about the trucks that beep when they went backward, and finally Angus, who had been out of breath, sat up. I saw something new there today, too, he said. More people than usual. They were walking slowly around the oval in the middle of the plaza and looking at rectangles full of nonsense. It sounded to everyone like a typically inane and inexplicable thing that humans do, and so we moved on. We told stories about ducks, so many stories, all ridiculous and impossible to make funnier, and we all worried together about the bison who were getting older and who would never be free, and then we left the top of the rock and went on our respective ways. It was late in the day, not yet night, when I realized it was Sunday. Sunday is when the people close off some of the roads inside the park so they can bike and roller skate and walk without cars, and I have to say these Sundays are a mix of the good and the troubling. The cars I don't miss, but the number of people in the park doubles or triples, and every new person is a potential hassle, and the hassles they do come. On these days, I have to watch for the helpers who want to know whose dog I am, the helpers who want to pet me, the helpers who want to check if I have tags, the helpers who think I need their help. Now this Sunday was warm and sunny and full of humans. They laid down their blankets and ate their food on the wide lawns. They took out their cameras and took pictures of themselves in front of trees and flowers and next to other humans. These things are not so interesting, but on Sundays come some intriguing things do happen. Near the white glass cathedral of flowers, there were people making music with golden horns while other people dance. They bring some boxes, and the music comes from the boxes, and they dance in pairs all over the road near the cathedral, and that is something to see. They are mostly ridiculous, but some are elegant, and all are happy, and so I watch from a safe distance, and I love them all very much. 
dogs do a not dance. I am okay with it. On Sundays, not far from the dancers, there's something better even, and that is the roller skating people. They are my favorite of all the humans. They are so beautiful. On Sundays, on a side street, they set up an oval, and in the oval, someone sets a black box onto the pavement, and from it comes music, thumpy music with horns punching above the thumping, and then the skaters go round and around the oval, and they make dance moves to the music, and that is easy, but they are on skates. Skates, which makes all of the dancing loose-limbed and strange and sublime. And from the woods, I watch and watch this kind of roller skate dancing, and I am brimming with bliss. Among the skate dancers is a man I call the Cape, for he wears one. He wears pants, but no shirt, and he is surely an older man of the human species, but still he rules the roller skate oval, and perhaps that is why he wears the Cape. The cape goes around the oval, and he makes snaky movements and watery movements, and sometimes he skates very low, and sometimes he raises his face and his arms high in the air, and sometimes he rests, standing and heaving and watching from the middle of the oval as the other humans, women and men and children, go around and around. Normally, this would be all that might happen in a day, and I would report all this not news to the bison, and that would be that. But while I was watching the cape, I saw, using my extraordinary vision, something new in the plaza. It was the something Angus had mentioned, but it was even more intriguing than he'd implied. Beguiling, even. I ran like rain to the scene.